Hello, hitchhikers. You're listening to AHK42.com, a hitchhiker's guide to 42. I hope you enjoy my show, and if you do, please share it or follow us on our Twitter, which is at Talk. AHK42 or our Facebook which is a hitchhiker's guide to 42 also at talk AHK42 search us find us like us share us today we'll be speaking with Dr Arlen Andrews he is an author and his new book is called Silicon Blood it's a sci-fi novel He is also the founder of Sigma, the science fiction think tank which works with the US government and non-profit organisations to provide the unique futurism of science fiction writers for those who need it most. But first a break and then we'll be speaking with Dr Arlen Andrews. Stay tuned. We have main engine start. Four, three, two, one and lift off. Fallen Angels, available at nickturner.com. Next up, Dr. Arlen Andrews. I've got Arlen Andrews with me. Hello, Arlen. Hi, how are you? I'm okay. And Arlen's um, an amazing author, especially with his sci-fi novels, one which is out now called Silicon Blood. Um, why don't you give us a little bit of your background, please, Colin? Okay, uh, Leah, thank you uh, for having me on first. You're my background welcome. is I, uh, I've been an engineer most of my life. I worked at White Sands Missile Range all the way to the White House Science Office. I did a couple of, I did a couple of startup companies of my own, a virtual reality company that was on the NASDAQ stock market for a while. And I've done other uh, startup companies and some were successful and most of them failed. Right. But I'm retired. I'm retired now, and I'm a full-time researcher and writer, uh, interested in science fiction first and uh, in ancient technologies and ancient sites and that sort of thing. It's amazing um, your background um, and how it's got you to where you are today. What inspired you to uh, start to write, Arlen? Well, uh, my father read to me quite a bit when, when I was an infant. Uh, so I would have been writing stories since I was in second or third grade. But I got a typewriter at age 14, and so I've been writing a lot ever since. But what really started me writing was uh, reading science fiction. I grew up in rural Arkansas, right. out in the backwoods, uh, half of my life. And uh, I came across a Robert Heinlein novel, Red Planet, back when I was nine years old. Wow. We picked it up from the bookmobile that the county sent out little libraries uh, every week. And then we picked up a book and uh, I read a book called Red Planet. And I said, this is pretty good. Is there anything else like this? Mm-hmm. And that led me into the whole realm of science fiction. After many years of reading it, I decided, you know, I have stories I would like to tell as well. And so I started. Uh, I was in my 30s before I started selling science fiction, however. But uh, I've been writing now for 40 years and. It's it's fun. It's my way of life, really. Oh, it's it's wonderful that you actually get time now to sit down and concentrate solely on that. Well, uh, I am married, and uh, we have a house and dogs, and my wife has a lot of honey do things for me to do. So it's not <laughs> all writing every day. <laughs> no, no, we've all got uh, our home things to do. We can't always play. You had asked about that novel, Silicon Blood. Yes, <laughs> it uh, is a near future novel which I hope never really occurs, but it was fun to write. It's a story about uh, mature nanotechnology. Nanotech machines, the size of viruses are smaller. The the uses and misuses of those. In the story, uh, we have a female president, and she decides to go ahead and use those 
upon recommendation by her national security people to eliminate the cocaine trade by eliminating cocaine and by eliminating the body's reaction addiction to it. Right. Yeah. The cocaine cartels are rather unhappy about that. And so they retaliate and other people retaliate against them. And it turns out to be a worldwide disaster. Right. And then uh, one of the people involved uh, feels very guilty that he's killed almost a million people. And uh, he spends his life trying to uh, make up for that and punish the bad guys that, that are now taking advantage of that. Wow. So it's, it's virtual reality. It's nanotechnology. It's all the all the current buzzwords, although I thought of the story quite a while ago. And what, how would you feel if it was turned into a movie? Someone approached you and said, right, we want to make this a movie, because at the end of the day, I think it should be. But what would you be like? What would be your uh, answer? Yes, uh, most of the things I write, the novels and the short stories and everything else, I visualize first. Yeah. I wish I could go straight from my brain right to video and I can make my own movies that way. But, yeah, I would love to see them in the movie form or TV. Yeah. I mean, there's tech out there now uh, that they're trying to get um, information from the brain and then put onto a computer chip. <laughs> so you never know. <laughs> I wrote a story about 20 years ago called Parameters of Dream Flight yeah. in which um, we took some of the virtual reality I was working on at the time and uh, transferred that into the brain. And so you could watch somebody's... Uh, dreams and their thoughts oh, in real wow. time oh wow that that would be amazing to see it, it, it was a nasty story i mean uh, what things going in our brains that we really don't want other people to see mm, and, oh yeah in the, in the story they were harvesting all that stuff and using it for bad purposes but mm. it, it will happen sometime next 10 or 20 years you'll be able to do that yeah yeah i mean they're saying now that they can um, put thing uh, memories or something or computer uh, technology on one strand of dna is, is that right I can't remember now. Uh, they, some people can. Yeah, DNA can be used for storage. Yeah. But we probably won't do that. You can go down to the quantum level and store billions of times more stuff down at the quantum level, down at the atomic level or below. Wow. That's really interesting. Well, um, you actually worked um, in the science area of the White House, did you not? Yes, the White House Science Office. I was a fellow there, mm. 1992, 1993. Right. And um, also I read that you um, imagined, well, you wrote about uh, a science fiction, in a science fiction novel about uh, uh, people will be using computerized books and it actually come out tr to be truth in the end. They actually yeah, I, Yes, I, I put it in a story about 1992, 93. Uh, I had a concept that it, it was only a throwaway idea in a story about spaceships, but they, the, the pilot, she had a uh, essentially a paperback book, but it had blank pages all the time until she called up whatever she wanted. It, it would be populated with any kind of book mm. uh, material that was out there. So uh, that's what she did. So it was just a throwaway idea. Other people have had similar ideas. I think that was the first time that was presented, that you would have a blank book you carried all the time, mm -hmm. and you would, by voice command or computer, just call up and say, I would like to see uh, Don Quixote. I'd like to see Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see you know, erotica, whatever it is you want, and it would show up mm -hmm. on those pages. And it's only about 100 pages long, and when you get to the end, it would repopulate with the next 100 pages. And Oh, it's, just, it's just a brilliant idea, and the fact that it come true, I bet you were amazed. Well, that's one thing about reading science fiction and writing science fiction. I'm, there's hundreds of people who write it and millions who read it. Mm. Uh, you're often delighted, but you're seldom surprised. Right, okay. So, oh, that's cool. That's, that's kind of neat. Yeah, I'm, so we're very, very seldom shocked in the science fiction world. Right, okay. So if, if I was to ask you then, um, what kind of science fiction, um, say, tech, that would you like to see actually come true out of, out of your uh, books? Well, I would, at the age I am, I would like to see uh, something that would re rejuvenate my body back to about age 25. Right, yeah. Don't we all? <laughs> I'd love that. <laughs> that's, that's that's first, no aches and pains and no diseases. Yeah. And I'd, I'd like to see it not just for me, but guess what? I'd like to see it for the whole human race where nobody gets sick. Yeah, and like nobody in, a, in a way like that Elysium. Have you seen that movie? 
I could only watch the first half hour of it. Okay. The, the, the politics was so thick in there that, uh, you know, I, I, I watch entertainment to be entertained, not to be preached. At. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, at the end of this movie, they, so they, they had this um, bed where they laid it down and then the computer just fixed everything. I mean, this man, he had his face blown off with a, with a gun with a bullet and um, he just laid down and this computer before everyone's eyes just fixed all of his face and put all his face back and he was okay again. Oh, well, that's good. Mm, yeah, kind of neat, I thought. Yeah. Uh, Better um, not to get shot to, to, to start with, though. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you've also, I mean, you've wrote a countless number of books and articles. I mean, how many books is it now that you've got out? Well, uh very few books, probably uh, probably half a dozen that I've written. Right. Uh, but stories, stories, about a hundred stories, and articles, and columns, uh, all together adds up to about five hundred or so. Yes. And, and uh, some of, some were done uh, for a magazine in your country, uh, the New Scientist. I wrote a series of articles for them as a correspondent at White Sands Missile Range when I was watching. The vertical takeoff and landing rockets there. This is amazing because SpaceX with their vertical takeoff and landing, I mean, it's all over the TV. Well, it's not actually all over the TV. It is online, but they're not really talking about it and it being so excited about it like they should, I don't think, on the television with the news, the main news channels and things. Well, sometime you might Google the letters DCX. DCX. Okay. It was a rocket project. And in 1993, it was flown by a computer mouse by astronaut Pete Conrad uh, at White Sands. It flew up about 500 feet and stopped, moved sideways, moved back again, and then landed. That's crazy. That is awesome. I wrote an article about it, and I presented it at the World Science Fiction Convention in 1993, and I said – this is the uh, first spaceship that takes off and lands the way God and Robert Heinlein intended. Yeah. That particular phrase has been used in the industry ever since now for the last almost 25 years. <laughs> That's amazing. How, uh, that, way, sorry, go on. And so, yes, it was a uh, vertical takeoff and landing device, that, or rocket that was made by the Air Force and flown about half a dozen times. Uh, they turned it over to NASA, and the first NASA flight, it crashed, fell on its side, and oh, exploded. God. And somebody called me up uh, a few months later when I was working in New Mexico, and they said, there's a dumpster you might want to go to with a pickup truck. Oh, no. And, and the dumpster was full of rocket parts, which I kept until a couple of years ago, and I turned it over to the New Mexico Museum of Science and Space History at Alamogordo, New Mexico. I, they are rebuilding rockets there uh, just for show, not for launch. Oh, that's good. That's keeping it all of the history alive, isn't it, as well, so people so, can actually visually see it. They were the first ones to do it, McDonnell Douglas Aircraft and the uh, and the Air Force. Unfortunately, in 1996, uh, NASA decided to go with another version that didn't work. Mm. And But a lot of the engineers who worked on that original DCX rocket went to work for either SpaceX or Jeff Bezos. Right. So some of those people that worked on the rockets that are now working were the guys who did it 20 years ago. That's good. So, I mean, it's great that they're still working on them, but, I mean, it's a shame that it crashed the first time NASA used it then. So otherwise they'd be oh, yeah. using it now. We could have had them flying to the moon by now. Oh, no. But, you know, that's, that's another story, literally another story. Yes, it is. Yeah, that's not, we'll not step on the moon, uh, so to speak, pun intended. Um, I also would like to ask you about your um, your article that you you contributed to Atlantis Rising magazine didn't you recently as well or not recently Uh, was it last year yes I've been writing for them for about 10 years oh okay excuse me sorry I didn't realise an engineer looks at Noah's Ark so is it, hang on, it's Ken Ham. Ken Ham is building a replica of Noah's Ark costing $90 million, which is currently under construction in Kentucky. Well, actually, it was finished uh, over a year ago. And it's <gasps> been 
it's been open ever since. I went there last October and toured for a day and then wrote an article about it in Atlantis Rising that was in their January and February 2017 issue. Mm. Uh, I went to look at it as an engineer. Mm. Uh, it was a difficult article to write because I want to present it fairly, but I'm not proselytizing or preaching to anybody about it. Mm. First off, First off, if you read in Genesis and the Bible, the uh, description of the ark is very short. They give some dimensions, and it it'll, it'll should be covered with pitch inside and out, and it's got a window a cubit wide across the length of it, and that's about it. Right. So I wondered how they could build a full-scale replica of that <clears throat> with only that in, little bit of information. Mm. So I went there, and the, first off, the thing I didn't say in the article is, obviously, it was not their replica was not covered in pitch. Uh, it, otherwise, it would look ugly, you know, but with tar inside and out. They didn't have that. No. But it is over 500 feet long. I think it's uh, 80 feet wide and 50 feet high. Mm. And uh, I walked through it as an engineer thinking about the technology that if the story were literally true, mm. what would they have used and how could they have done it? And actually, they answered every question I could think of uh, and some I didn't think of very well ahead of time and uh, down to the point of having even baby dinosaurs aboard the ark, 23 types of dinosaurs. No way. <clears throat> and so if, in the article, you can see the pictures that I took and uh, okay. I would recommend anybody who's over here and has the time to take an afternoon or whatever morning and go see it. Mm. Uh, it's a lot of walking uh, for older people and disabled people. They do have a uh, cheap, electric carts you can ride up and down it's 500 feet long and there's you have to walk it about five or six times to see everything the way i ended it was uh i mean first off they they as an engineer they addressed uh, stability they addressed ventilation for all the animals they addressed how many animals they needed uh they addressed uh waste disposal for animals really? uh, cool how much food if you only had i think eight people aboard how they would have lived and they went through all these things and uh Okay, from an engineering standpoint, it made sense. They obviously invented these things as they went along because the Bible does not say anything about that. Mm. But my conclusion was, if you are a fundamentalist believer, then that will reinforce your faith. If you're not, it's still an interesting afternoon uh, excursion into an alternate reality. Mm. Uh, they, they state up front that the purpose of building the ark replica was to convince people of the reality of many of the Old Testament's uh, descriptions. And then they get that then as evidence for the truth of the New Testament. Religiously, you know, a religious person has no problem with it. And if you're not, then you can enjoy it for what it was. Even if they only used what they could out of the Bible, what it would let them know, you know, with the measurements and such, it, it actually shows you that it could be a possibility and it could do the job that it stated it did do. Yeah, the way they've the way they've rebuilt it, and the way they described how they gave consideration to all these things, you know. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's I, fantastic. It, it, it could have worked. Mm. I, I I don't myself. I do not personally believe every detail of that story. I do think there were ancient cataclysms and there were floods mm. and everything else. Mm. And uh, this story is a worldwide story, so. Uh, it happened in a lot of places. I think there were cometary impacts and ice age melting and all that kind of stuff. Mm. So, I mean, sometimes people would suggest that it, some of it, I mean, it, everything has an element of truth. Um, I guess some stories, or as you wouldn't have an idea, maybe. But, um, but um, would it stand, do you think, by the size of that, um, say a tsunami uh, type um, catastrophe, do you think? Would it, <clears throat> excuse me, would it have survived something like that? I don't yeah. know. Mm. Uh, in the story, I mean, in the demonstration there, they at the Ark Park, they call it. Ark uh, Park. <laughs> Ark, Ark Encounter, but everybody here calls it the Ark Park. Uh, they say it took, you know, tw over 20 years to build, and uh, they had plenty of time to get ready for it. And uh, they give a lot of, and, and they have an animatronic guy that looks like, a little robot that looks like Noah. He's saying, you know, it took us a long time to build this thing. And uh, people, say it was, people say it was a localized flood, but if it was a localized flood, God would have just told us to move. That would be a lot easier than building this big boat. <laughs> yeah. it, it, so it's it's humorous and everything else, and, uh, but it it's kind of uh, 
interesting to see Adam and Eve uh, uh, with dinosaurs, brontosauruses, and oh, velociraptors, and all that sort of stuff around. It's uh, something for everyone then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I recommend it. I, you know, I don't promote it, but I do recommend it. No, if you're, I... you're yeah, but I mean, it's a, it's amazing. I mean, we haven't got anything like that over here. I'd definitely go and see it. You know, put all my um, views and, and things aside anyway for anything like that. Um, it's an experience in itself, isn't it? Um, yeah, I think everybody, everyone needs to challenge their own beliefs uh, once in a while. I mean, reality, reality is a lot broader than we've ever been taught. And uh, who knows? I, I'm not in favor of... Uh, suppressing anybody's ideas about stuff like that you know yeah. first of all it doesn't, it doesn't hurt anybody no. and uh, secondly it's entertaining in a way yeah exactly i mean people often wondered how big it would be and what would such a um, a craft like that look like so yeah it's, a, it's large and that's my first word i think <laughs> my god this thing is big <laughs> i bet they needed a big park for that to go on <laughs> especially when they're building oh, I- it you're driving down the interstate and it's a mile away and you can see it off in the distance and it's still huge. Oh, fantastic. But imagine 500 feet long. I guess that's almost two of our football fields long. Yeah. I mean, didn't they um, say, um, not really going off topic, but didn't they say that they thought that they found the actual base of the Ark in somewhere in Turkey, in one of the mountain ranges there? I, I have seen so many video, video TV specials about that. I don't know. I, yeah. There are a lot of things that could have happened. First off, there could have something like this could have happened, and the ancient boat was there, and then people saw it and made up stories about it. Mm. Or, alternatively, uh, it might have been some kind of monks or believers back in the early Christian era might have gone up there and, or actually the Jewish era even, mm. gone up there and built something as a testament to their faith. I, I don't know. I'll believe it when they find something and can carbon date it to. 12,000 years ago. Yeah, yeah. I think that's when, that's when the cataclysm happened, 12,800 years ago. Right. And uh, if you can find something from those days. Uh, you know, you find something like Gobekli Tepe, the mm. buried temples, structures over there in Turkey. Mm. And they've actually dated those to be 12,000 years old. Yeah. And uh, so that's something that's real. You can go touch it. You can see it. Uh, people can date it. Uh, they, it's a lot easier to believe in something like that mm. that than all these stories of the Ark, uh, because they're all contradictory and there's no real evidence, unfortunately. Well, you go to visit quite a lot of historic areas and um, and some uh, places where you, you can't even fathom the technology that they use to cut certain stones and etc. from ancient times and how they even got the stones where they were. You recently have done a few videos with Brian Forrester, who um, he does the Inca tours and etc. Yes, I've seen a short little clip about yourself. I'll link it up with um, this show for others, for listeners to have a look at. You discuss about this um, stone, which looks to be like um, an educator's stone of how they're using water and making the water flow. Could you can you remember what that one was? I'll read yes, that's called the Soweti stone. Soweti. One way to spell that is S A W S A Y W I T E. Uh, that's one of uh, Brian Forster's online uh, videos on YouTube. It's called uh, uh, Model of Ancient Inca City or something like that. Yes, thank you. It, it, it's, it's there, and um, I had written an article about it in 2006 for um, Atlantis Rising magazine. Mm. I, I give a, an explanation there, but uh, I went down five years ago with my son to that stone, and we poured water in it, and... We found that water does run downhill. <laughs> yeah. Uh, found that the stone had been repaired in places. What this is for your listeners, is a stone about 13, it's an egg-shaped stone about 13 feet long, mm-hmm. about uh, 8 feet high. And the top of it has been carved into over 200 different figures. Uh, there are channels that look like rivers, uh, places that look like dams, look like fields, look like uh, all kind of hydraulic diversion areas. Um uh, and I looked at it a uh, long time online before I actually went there, and I'm convinced when I went there that this was actually used probably by their water priests, what do they want to call them, hmm. to demonstrate how water flows for archaeological, I mean, for hydraulic 
uh, for uh, agricultural projects. Mm. The Incas and other people there before them were very, very good at making uh, channels for water, diverting water. Sometimes their channels run underground for miles. Mm. And so I felt that this was a stone in which more than likely the educated people brought in new technicians and engineers. They said, we want to build, uh, we want to irrigate crops on the other side of the mountain over here. Mm. How do we do that? Mm. So these guys would show them, here, here's a model. This is what you do. You measure it so long and so wide and so far down. And uh, there are elements built into that stone. I mean, like I said, there are hundreds of carvings in there. Yeah, because some of them have been broken off, hadn't they, you noticed? Yeah. Unfortunately, the, some stupid people a few years ago made a plaster cast of it. And when they did, they uh, broke off a bunch of chunks of it. That was pitiful. Oh, no. But they, from that, they made a replica that they have outside their museum in Lima, Peru. Oh, right. But they, but it's okay. The damage wasn't that bad. Mm. <clears throat> what you can tell is it was a hydraulic model. Yeah. They used, a, and you can tell where they've actually gone in and done other carvings in there. So I think occasionally maybe somebody said, we built this canal over here, yeah. and it worked really well. And so they come back, okay, let's measure it, and let's put it down. In our model here, this is our basic model. Today we have 3D CAD models on computers, computer-aided design CAD models. Mm. In those days, they didn't have software, but they had hardware. They had a big stone, and they they mm. put everything they learned into that, and they could teach they could teach succeeding generations mm. how water flows. Yeah, like an ancient think tank as well. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, and they might have had religious purposes, but I don't think so. They I was in contact with some engineers down in Colombia, South America, who went out there and looked at it. And their conclusion was whoever did it was as brilliant as a Newton back in those days. They had the Newton of the Andes that, yeah. that figured some of these things out. Before uh, you you went there and using your engineer in mind, um, what did people say that it actually was? What were they trying to say to everybody? Because sometimes when they don't know what something is, they'll just go to the most – most known and research part of the whole thing and then say well it's done by these people because these people lived there say a thousand years ago and then some these get carbon dated and things like that what did they say that it was before you and brian and the team got there there's no way there's no way to carbon date stone unfortunately right. I hope somebody comes up with a <laughs> sorry with, somebody <laughs> look at cosmic rays and <laughs> Cosmic ray absorption or something. I think somebody will someday. <laughs> so, uh, it's always everything is always a religious thing. Uh, some people said, "Oh, they were pouring blood down it," and there's no evidence <laughs> that, that, that the Incas did blood rites or anything. I mean, the Aztecs and people did much later, but mm. there's no evidence. Everything's religious. Everything's religious. I mean, uh, ten thousand years from now, if our society is gone and a new one builds up, and they all come around to most of the houses, at least in, the, in America here, and they'll find these uh, white porcelain things with an unusual shape. Mm. And they'll say every home had one of these, so it must have been a ritual where they worship household gods or something. And yeah. No, in our case, we, we call them toilets. Oh, no. You, but that, that's all that would be left. You know, in the portion of the last tens of thousands of years, everything else would be gone. But yeah. They'll, they'll look, and I think that's the way we look at it. people in the ancient days. You know, religion was important. Yeah. But religion, what they call religion, is what we would call a way of life. In other words, uh, everything Everything fits together. Mm. There's no difference between heaven and earth, gods and men and animals. It's all one thing. Mm. And uh, But they had needs. Uh, if you look at Machu Picchu, you can see the fountains, the, the runoff, where the waste materials handled. Uh, mm. In the ancient times, people had daily needs. You had to wait, have a way to make a fire and get rid of the smoke. You had a way to get rid of your own personal waste and wash it away where it wasn't unhealthy. And mm. they had those problems too. And most ancient civilizations solved them. Mm. And now we look at them and, uh, my big complaint with Egyptologists and a lot of archeologists, including some of my own family, that we seem to look at everything in the past. If you can't explain it, it's gotta be religious. Yeah. Well, Chris Dunn, my friend, best friend, and he's originally from Manchester, wrote these books, mm. the Giza power plant, and lost technologies of ancient Egypt, in which he goes in and shows uh, how they had to, somebody had to have used some kind of machines, mm -hmm. high-speed machines, to do some of this work. But then, uh, what they did it for might have been a religious thing. I mean, you, you use technology in the old days to build cathedrals; that's fine. But the uh, 
the idea was uh, not everything is religious. Some no. sometimes you have to do you have to eat and sleep and mm. medicine and do your job and. Yeah. But <clears throat> what I'm saying about Chris Dunn, he was one of the first people to go and look at ancient Egypt with an engineer's mind. Yeah. How did you do this stuff? I forget what it was used for. This, how did you do it? And mm. I was there with him in 2008 mm. at Luxor and uh, wow, cool. these, these other places. And he showed me the machine marks around the backs of these statues that no, no Egyptologist ever looks at. It, things that cannot be done by hand. Now, I don't know what kind of machines they had. They might have mm. been... Oxen powered, they might have been electrical powered, but they were high speed and mm. they were not the tools that you see in the Cairo Museum. Mm. You go to the Cairo Museum like we did, you see a glass case of all these tools that they used to build their entire civilization. Yeah. <clears throat> there are rocks and there are bird bones and there are some bronze chisels mm. and uh, handheld tools and wooden tools. Mm. No, they did not build that, that civilization with those tools. Yeah. Now, they built the civilization, like Chris said, you think 3,000 years of building here, they never improved on their tools? No, exactly. I mean, I mean, you know, they weren't stupid. Look what they've got. They've got things left that will be there, standing there, while our civilization is totally gone. Mm. The pyramids will still be there. And uh, so they don't give, to me, this archaeologists don't give enough credit to artisans, artists, technicians, no. and engineers. Mm. We should be the ones looking at this along with them, of course. Yeah. None of us can read hieroglyphics and wouldn't even want to, no. but we, we're interested in how the hieroglyphics are made. Mm. And Chris Dunn showed me at Karnak, some of these hieroglyphs are almost an inch deep. Yeah. They're 0.15 inches across. Mm. And uh, you go, look at the bottom with a microscope like he showed me, and you can see the little rotating tool that cut it. No, I never knew that bit. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. I've been there myself, but not the Cairo area. But um, there's been a recent debate, uh, well, I won't mention what page it was, about um, how the Egyptians possibly used different tools and et cetera. And, when, and then there were some archaeolo um, archaeologists that are still at college or university, sorry, and they mentioned, oh, look, the, you know, the stones were pulled by ropes and they cut it with chisels, just get over it. That was her reply. And it was a shame, really, because you think they're, they're still studying archaeology and if that's what what's coming out and they're not prepared to open them, um, you know, to step back a bit and invite new ideas, it's going to be a, um, a dying thing, I hope, anyway, with archaeology and they, leaving it to the uh, people who are willing to accept uh, different methods were actually used and we just haven't found them yet. The, uh, uh, that's it. I, I keep hoping when <clears throat> they dig up things and there will be a machine shop that they'll find there with all the real tools yeah just get a hoover on that on that sahara yeah, I, uh, somewhere instead of finding another mummy or another sarcophagus let's find the actual tools but mm. as i mentioned in the introduction to chris's latest book there the yes. uh, uh when civilization falls apart uh, finished metals are the most important thing you can have more important than gold or silver or uh you know mm. So the slabs of metal, pieces of metal. Mm. Uh, if our civilization falls apart, an automobile will be a, a treasure for the people in the future a thousand years from now because you can rip off a fender and make a, a sword out of it or a knife or a needle or a fish hook or something. And mm. that's what the ancients did as well. Why? They did the same thing. And so after 100 years, 200 years of savagery, people mm. will have recycled all that stuff. And mm. a machine shop would be a perfect place for uh, people to go in and – and Rob, I mean, uh, yeah, get Barry in your uh, sheet metal quick. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's what you yeah. Do, you? exactly. Well, getting back to um, Chris Dunn, um, do you think uh, somatics were were uh, used at all in all of these ancient sites with these stones, uh, somatics, or or even the um, Egyptian schist disc? Is it schist? Correct me if I'm saying it wrong. Um, that rather than people saying it was um, something that they wove rope out of, what if somebody I think in a in a science lab of a university made a replica and spun it, but still with a with a drill tool they spun it really fast and it ended up being like levitated a disc on a on a metal pole of the schist disc. Do you think I I haven't heard that? I I do know that the one that's there in the museum is. Uh is not symmetrical and it's not balanced. Right. 
uh, Chris told me about that. He he looked at it in detail. I wasn't that interested in that one, but uh, he mm. he looked at it. And not only that, but it can be carved. Uh, there are uh, instructions on the Google. You can Google that. Mm. And stonemasons can show you how it can be carved out of a solid piece of stone. It's not molten stone or anything else. I, oh, okay. There's so many so many things like that that I uh, I don't get into. There are just too many things to be interested in. Yeah. I, and like I said, I'll leave the machining and all that kind of stuff up to Chris Dunn and mm. how fast you can re- re- remove the metal. I am interested in the machines that might have done it, but uh, that's that's his area and – they had advanced stuff. I mean, they, the in, internal workings of the Great Pyramid are mm. hydraulic and I don't know, electric on. Mm. The day that about five or six years ago, ten years ago, whenever they found those uh, copper plugs on that little uh, a piece in the wall of when Gatenbrink's uh, right. the room went up there. Mm. And then when they drilled through and they found those extending little copper plugs sten- extending through to the other side and mm. – Chris and I were on the phone to each other. We were looking at it, and we said, my God, there's, there's a wiring diagram, all those red marks behind that wall that they saw on the wall yeah. and everything else. It's a wiring diagram. It showed somebody how to wire it up. <gasps> wow. And, uh, yeah, there's a an article in Atlantis Rising called the Pyramid Electric that Chris wrote Pyramid some years ago. Right. I'm making all these notes from you. We'll be busy later. Like, Atlantis Rising is, is a good thing. Uh, yeah. I forget when it was, probably six or seven years ago, but he, he called the uh, – it was called the Pyramid Electric. I had an article in that same magazine that time. Mine was called Indians and Aliens. Oh, yeah. So it's <laughs> – What was that about? Please, you have to say oh, something about that now. <laughs> uh, I looked into uh, ancient Cherokee Indian uh, oh. legends and stories. Okay. And if you look at it from a UFO alien perspective, it sounds a lot like Alien Encounters. Oh, okay. And there was a movie out at the time called Cowboys and Aliens. Oh, and yes. So I, I did it. It wasn't tongue in cheek. It was a serious article. Yeah. Uh, mm. it, if you think about it, that's one way to explain some of those things. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, the Do- Dogon tribe. Or is it a Dogon tribe? They all um, have uh, certain outfits and stuff that look t- kind of look extraterrestrial, don't they? The, how they celebrate the um, visitors that they had years ago. Yeah, that, that's uh, Robert F. Temple wrote a good book about that. He is, yeah. he's uh, he's the same one who wrote a book. He used to be a professor here in Louisville, Kentucky, in fact, years ago. Fantastic. Uh, but I think he's a Brit. He wrote a book called The Crystal Sun. Crystal Sun. And it's he talks about all the lenses, optical lenses that have been found around the world and in today's museums, in fact, showing that the ancients probably actually had telescopes and microscopes. Right, okay. That's the Crystal it. Sun, and that, that's that's an excellent book as well. Yeah, I'll go have a look at that, definitely. There's, I mean, there's a lifetime of interesting things out there, and that's why I try to have to limit mine a little bit because <laughs> – I don't have enough years left to read everything I want to read. I, I'm looking right now at a bookshelf I've got across from me that people say, have you read all those books? I say, yeah, I have. Oh, but, my uh, goodness. I've lived a long time, and uh, I'm looking at Graham Hancock's shelf of his, and I've got Chris Dunn's books next to his. Cool. cool. I've got a bunch of uh, John Michelle books, oh. and um, there are just so many interesting things. I think it all ties together with an ancient civilization that was wiped out mm. at the Younger Dryas, which was about, uh, what, 12,800 years ago. Right. And what do, you th- and what do you think was it then, the ancient cataclysm? Well, well uh, probably comet or asteroid impacts. Right. The latest thing I read just last week was that they found a lot of distribution of... Uh, Platinum mm. on the east coast of the United States is scattered out to our west coast, mm. and then they said that is characteristic of a comet or an asteroid. Right. Something came in, and that might have been what happened. And uh, they think something came in and hit. There was a huge, uh, the uh, a glacier, uh, probably a comet or asteroid came in and hit that two mile thick glacier mm. and made a real mess and uh, left debris all over, part of which was platinum. At the same time, they think that uh, in Graham Hancock's book, latest one, The Magicians of Gods, can, talks about that. 
mm-hmm. and other people have talked about it before, it probably wiped out most of the native North Americans and all the megafauna, mm-hmm. uh, mastodons, saber-toothed tigers, uh, dire wolves, yeah. mammoths, all mm-hmm. those things were wiped out just in either the first few seconds after the thing hit yeah. or in the, after that when all this ice and debris and all the stuff started coming back down. That started a uh, period called the Younger Dryas. Mm. And about 1,900 years later, uh, it, another one hit. So there was about 1,900 years, I believe, of uh, storms and darkness. Oh, and real awful. Mess. Just sound unimaginable, isn't it, really? Oh, oh, I wouldn't know. Um, it must have been awful. Anyway, let's put it that way. Yeah, we're, the human race is lucky to have survived it, I think. Yeah. That's the, that's the point. And, you know, and the thing is, I hate to say it, but it can happen again any any given moment. Yeah, I know. We've got to start looking after the planet, too. It would help, <laughs> wouldn't <laughs> yeah, it? Yeah, I, well, I'm looking out for the asteroids. We keep them away and the comets away. Then. <laughs> Do you think... We'll... Sorry. Do you, do you think that we would ever be able to invent something that will blast an asteroid to, or give it a push to a, a different direction if one was to uh, be coming close to Earth? It depends on how how far out it was. <clears throat> if we found something that's coming out in the next 72 hours or next week, probably not. No. If we, had, if we had a couple of years to go, then, yeah, we could probably get somebody out there or something out. And it wouldn't take much depending on the size of it, you could put a small rocket motor or a, a couple of atomic blasts just to push it sideways. Right. Get it out of the way. Mm. Um, you know, the one that hit Chelyabinsk, uh, Russia, mm. about five years ago. Yes. Two, four years ago. That, that was a pretty scary. I'm, I'm really happy that did not occur during the Cold War because that was the Russian equivalent of Los Alamos. Right. If they'd had something come in exploding in the air above that place, it might have been a, had a nasty result. Yes, yes. Uh, so, so I'm glad it didn't happen. On the other hand, people have said if that Tunguska meteor that came in in 1908 mm. hit Siberia and wiped out 10,000 square miles, mm. if that had hit about eight hours later, it would have taken out Moscow. It would have vaporized Moscow. There, there would, Of course, then Lenin and Stalin and all those guys wouldn't have been there and history would have been a lot different. Yes, wouldn't it just? <laughs> <laughs> my god well sometimes it, it does make you think oh, i hope it would uh, hope one would land on such and such country <laughs> I, I i have a list <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think we all do <laughs> but, uh, you had asked once before too about uh before i forget it about sigma when i was yes, at the white house science office what, yeah i worked at the white house science office for about 15 months the last 12 months of george hw bush presidency the first few months of my fellow Arkansan, Bill Clinton. Yes. We're both we're both from Arkansas, you know, and right. I can sound just like him sometimes. <laughs> you can. That's a good one. I used to do that. I used to do that. I used to call people, and it, <laughs> their caller ID would show White House, and I would say, "Hi, this is Bill. I, can I talk to so and so?" Great. I, I, it was fun. I'm a cruel, I'm a cruel person. Anyhow, when I worked there, I used to go to all kind of meetings as a lowly staffer. I was nobody important, just a staffer, you know. And I went to meetings that the bosses didn't want to go to. And I went to all these meetings, and I heard all these bureaucrats talking about the future, right. future technologies and future events. And, and I got so bored. I said, you know, I have been to 100 science fiction conventions over the years, and the ordinary Star Trek fan out there or the ordinary reader of Heinlein or Asimov or these people, mm. they know more about the future than these bureaucrats. Yeah. I got very angry. at a, I won't go into the incidents, but I came back and wrote a manifesto. Said the future is too important to be left to futurists. Yeah, and I call it the group Sigma, just the Greek letter Sigma, meaning summation, a bunch of people getting together, and I mm. limited it at first to PhD scientists or engineers who also wrote science fiction. Mm. And it took a few years to take off, <clears throat> but eventually we started, probably about ten years ago, working our Department of Homeland Security and others. Mm. And we've probably done, I don't know, 10 years, probably some, I have to look at it, but 60 or 70 events mm-hmm. with our government, including uh, we did something called NATO 2030 a few years ago mm-hmm. with NATO people. <clears throat> we Five years ago, uh, four of us went to Saudi Arabia and gave a, a panel there 
on science fiction and di- disruptive technologies. And oh, right. I think we helped to launch the science fiction community in Saudi Arabia that's still going on now. Oh, excellent. Yeah, one of the guys we met, uh, a guy named Yasser Bajat, has got joint Saudi American or U.S. citizenship, and he lives in Jeddah, and he's got a couple of bestsellers out right now over in Saudi. Mm. And uh, he tells me that they had something like a comic con over there uh, a few weeks ago. <laughs> no way. And actually had a rock concert in Saudi, and so things are changing. Oh, and that's great. I said, we're here. I said, now, two of the people who went were women. Two, two of my Sigma members were women. Oh. <clears throat> uh, Catherine Ann Goonan and uh, Catherine Asaro, both very accomplished science fiction writers. Yeah. And also science fiction uh, scientists. And uh, and the other person who went was Mark O'Green. He was a fellow who did the uh, the uh, the uh, dialogue for the first Fallout game, which is a video game. Yeah, which is very popular. fantastic. Well, Mark was a uh, rock star over there. As soon as they found out who he was, they they swept him away. And I said, "Well, Arlen, you can't come because uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't leave the women behind." And this is a man only thing. I... A Saudi thing. So he came back the next day. I wonder what in the heck happened. He's, I said, "I had dinner with the king's grandson last night. It was a big party." <laughs> uh, but when we, when we got there, the women, of course, uh, we pulled up and limo, and the women had to go in one entrance and the men in another, mm-hmm. and they kept the women separate. Uh, behind big walls and stuff the first day. And oh, gosh. I, I, I talked to our host and said, you know, guys, this is the 21st century, for God's sake. You yeah. can't be this way. Yeah. They said, wait, wait till tomorrow. And the next day, it was all open. They had to do it the first day, I guess, to get the permission of the religious police. Oh, okay. But, uh, but anyhow, I said, we are here to subvert you. We're going to spread this virus of science fiction. Yeah. If you're going to write science fiction and read science fiction, you have to have an open mind. Mm. Uh, I grew up in the segregated South in Arkansas in the 1940s and 50s. Mm. I'm reading science fiction about green margins and (laughs) spider creatures from other stars and all this stuff. And how can you be prejudiced against your fellow human beings if if you're prepared to meet aliens, for God's sake? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's that's what we preach to the Saudis, and hopefully it's going to catch on. I mean, we, we did all of it, of course. It, they, they all have the internet and everything else, but yeah. uh, mm. all but right. we talked we talked to young women there, who uh, all you could see were their eyes behind their burkas or hijabs, what they call mm. it, and uh, niqab, and uh, they had never. They said we haven't read any science fiction. What do you recommend? I said, well, have you ever heard of H. G. Wells? No. Oh no. Yeah. Have you ever heard of Jules Verne? No. I said, well, in a way, I envy you because now. You get to experience now what I was experiencing at age 9 and 10, 11, you know. Aww. So hopefully we've changed a few minds. And well, I do hope. I do hope. But that's what Sigma does. We we do pro bono free consultation for the U.S. government. Right. And occasionally there are some what we call beltway bandits who are con- that are contractors yeah. who work for the government, and they pay us for that because they get paid. And mm-hmm. They have to pay the people. That, so yeah. we don't. We don't turn down payment, no. but mostly it's for free. We, uh, I, I did a thing just finished uh, yesterday. In fact, uh, one of the groups is having the U.S. Army is having a science fiction <clears throat> story writing contest uh-huh. about specific future warfare type things. Uh-huh. And so I was one of the judges, and I went over all these stories. And uh, some people are good storytellers, and some are good inventors, and they don't necessarily mesh. Mm. But <clears throat> but I, I judged which ones are good and which ones mm. I thought were not quite so good. But mm. uh, some of the stories were extremely interesting, and some of them, like I said, one of them scared the hell out of me. Really? What what was that yeah. then? It was about a uh, – it was called the Second Korean War. Mm. It was about the crazy guy who uh, runs North Korea right now and all, some of the things that he did in this story at least. And mm. I said I it wasn't a good story. But it did scare the hell out of me, and everybody in our planning here in NATO should should read some of these things. And the lady wrote back today that, yeah, thank me for doing it, and said, yeah, they are going to take all the ideas and all the stories, whether they were judged good stories or not, and pass them out to all the planners, to mm. us and our allies. So that's good. Mm, yeah, it is. So, so we look at it from a science fiction perspective. Uh, mm. There are future futurist groups that – 
have conference calls every week, and I listen to one right before our call here, that uh, huh. some of the people in the U.S. government are actually looking at very reliable, to me, reliable predictions of the future. Mm. And they, huh. they weren't doing that when I started Sigma 25 years ago, but they are doing it now. So I, I feel very, very confident that there are people who are thinking ahead and they think like science fiction writers, even though they are not science fiction writers. Yeah, but it's like you accomplished a, a goal that's getting them interested and actually taking it seriously, like you said. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, Well, when I started 25 years ago, science fiction was not in all that good repute uh, amongst circles in D.C. I, that's why I limited it to PhDs to start with because mm -hmm. mostly if you show up inside Washington, if you're not an expert or world-class person in whatever you're doing, mm -hmm. nobody's going to listen to you. Right. And you say science fiction writers, they would laugh at us, but if a, mm -hmm. one of our guys was Lieutenant Colonel of the Air Force, one was from your country, uh, Charles Sheffield, that started uh, right. a uh, space company. These people all had PhDs and they were writing things and they're publishing and also did science fiction, so oh. they couldn't ignore us totally because there were these people doing accomplished things. Yes. So you, do you think then what's going on in the news at the moment, um, they're trying to say that um, people can now would be able to uh, listen to your device using sound waves to, to uh, put viruses into your phone or shut your phone down and things like that. Um, how would we tackle sort of, I should say, computer terrorism. How, how would we be able to stop, say, a, a massive event taking over all the computers and et cetera? Well, I'm not an expert on the Internet or anything, but I think there are enough servers out there <clears throat> distributed enough that probably more than likely mm. the uh, it'd be hard to have an attack to do that. Now, I think what the worst thing it could affect everybody would be what they call EMP, electromagnetic pulse. Right. You set off, you set off a hydrogen bomb uh, mm. 20, mile, 20 miles up and everything under it for a few hundred miles, square miles is going to be fried yeah. and your electronics are gone then. I might as well make a doorstop out of it because you'll never get back your computer or your iPhone or your iPod or iPad or anything. It, it, yeah. Or maybe your household electricity, <clears throat> everything would be fro melted and then you, yeah. that would be it. Uh, that's a different thing. Uh, cyber attacks. I mean, I listened to a whole conference call today about that very thing. Mm, uh, mm. Everybody's worried about it. When, when people first came up with computers, they didn't think about hacking so much. No. Uh, one of our Sigma members is a, a guy named Greg Benford, and he actually did mention that in a short story back in the 60s. Right. About it. They didn't call it hacking, but that's what it was, about hijacking a uh, c communications. I, I think what's going to happen, we're going to have to have the technology developed such that it can happen. Never, right. uh, if you get quantum communications, mm. as long as you don't melt the wires or the fiber optics that – communication is traveling over mm -hmm. you might be able to interfere with it but you'll never be able to tap it hack yeah. it listen into it yeah because i don't on a, on a more practical basis right now i'm talking to you on a, a laptop mm. uh what i've always done on my laptops for 10 years or more now is i've always put a piece a piece of a bandage tape over the, the camera yes <laughs> so if you tried to look at me on the skype you all you would see is a blur yes <laughs> I've actually so, got okay. some uh, silver duct tape over mine. <laughs> okay, whatever. We all recognize that. But not everybody re realized that, you know. No, not until recently, until it was written, <laughs> so everyone could see it, so it was and for while, real. <laughs> and while I'm sitting here with you, I've got uh, several uh, notices from my internet security virus detector that I've been hit at really? least twice with really? uh, malware that's been... I've uh, been quarantined, yeah. Oh, heck. I haven't checked mine. I don't even check mine just in case I ruin my recording. Well, <laughs> and then it all goes down. I, mean, I guess I have my notifications fixed so that it popped up. Here. Oh, okay. So hopefully it's working properly. Yeah. Catch them all. But uh, anyhow, the uh, yeah, I recommend if you were interested, uh, there's another uh, – well, if you look at IMDb, Internet yep. Movie Database, uh, that list – everybody you're interested in and you can see every place that Chris Dunn has shown up yeah. in the three or four places that I've shown up. I was 
I was on Ancient Aliens uh, for – they interviewed me for about three – for about an hour one time, and I had about 10 seconds on the show. Oh, gosh. Uh, there's a French movie out called Revelations of the Pyramids. Mm. And they interviewed me there one day for about three hours yeah. on top of a building in D.C. The French crew did. And then I was – I had probably five seconds in that movie. Do you think that they would manipulate then your answers to to suit what they wanted to hear? Do you think? Yes, they do. Yeah. Because they, the questions that they ask, uh, they keep asking. There was another movie I was in from the Canadians made called Nuclear Nine hmm. Eleven, and since I'd worked on those kinds of weapons before, they asked me uh, a bunch of questions that I just refused to answer, and they kept on and on and on asking over and over and over. So I finally gave them a nonsense answer that was good enough for them, and they... Right. I thought, you know, I, first off, I, I don't remember any of that stuff anymore. It's been many years, but at the time, I thought, you know, yeah, I don't want any bad guys uh, hearing anything I might have to say about anything, true or false. So I just made up an answer. Yeah. And, uh, well, says I'm right for keeping on badgering you about it. The other thing was, uh, in all my talk on uh, ancient aliens, I talked about those deeply etched uh, hieroglyphs at Karnak. And I gave Chris Dunn all the credit because he's the first one to notice it and point it out and written about it. Oh. Uh, they cut out all references to him, and it looked like I was taking credit for all that. Which, oh, no, uh, I, great. There is a uh, – there was a film – I still got it on my uh, DVR called uh, – TV show called uh, I think Ancient Impossible. Ancient, oh okay, I'm not heard Ancient of that one. It was filmed in the UK, and there's a uh, <clears throat> British engineer explaining everything that Chris Dunn has done without giving him any credit. I was furious oh, when I saw no. it, so I called Chris about it, and he said no. They had actually invited him to participate, and he couldn't do it for some reason, and he gave this other fellow permission to do it. Oh no! But they cut out. And I think that same guy also gave him credit for that, but they they cut it out. When a producer of a show has an agenda, they write a script, and uh, they don't want anything that's going to deflect from uh, their whatever their agenda is. Mm. But uh, Ancient Impossibles, look it up, and you'll you'll see in yeah. all these things about the uh, Petri drill cores and all the things that Chris came up with. Mm. Chris said, "Oh yeah, I know the guy. I gave him permission to do that, but." He said, if you look at the credits, they roll at the end real fast. You can see my name in there. He yeah. said, but. <laughs> you press pause and it's still blurry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. But that was a good show. A very interesting watch. And it's actually absolutely true. Yeah. But uh, just like in the show Ancient Aliens, they want you to say Ancient Aliens. Yeah. And I, I refuse to do it because I don't think there were. And in that show, they, they said you had to say the words Ancient Impossible or Impossible Ancient or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I get you. Well, and yeah. Brian, Brian even Brian Forster even said that that's what he had to say in some of those TV shows. He had to say ancient aliens, or they'll they would have cut him. Yeah, because he's been on recently on the new the um, new ancient aliens. What we get on our TV box anyway over here about um, all of his skulls and um, you know his investigations into those. And yeah, you can it, the, all the way through. It's like ancient theorists believe. It's not like, you know, these professionals who have been studying it for years. Not that. It's ancient theorists believe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, what do they, what's their answer? Everything is yes, aliens, always aliens. Yes. No, I, there's, a, there's a little bit of racism and culturalism in that because <laughs> a lot of these people think, these little brown people, there's no way they could have done all this stuff. Yes, yeah, We insulting. white Europeans didn't do it, so how could they have done it? Yeah, exactly. And, or even the brown Spaniards that went to Peru in those places. Uh, these people <laughs> couldn't have. Yes. <laughs> no, it's, it had exactly. to be somebody else who did it. No. Yeah, it's got to be extraterrestrials all the time. Can't, yeah, there we go. Can't explain no, it. Think, Aliens. I think people, people, everything we found so far <laughs> doesn't show any trace of mm. alien help. My wife said, we were watching it one night, Ancient Aliens, and she said, you know, our civilization is what six or eight thousand years old that we can trace back. I said, yeah. She said, didn't the ancients last that long before? I said, yeah, probably that long. <laughs> she said, why did they need aliens? We didn't need aliens to get where we are. Why would the ancients have needed aliens? Yeah. And I've used that quote many times because you know almost everything we have we can trace back to the beginnings. Yeah. We approximately when the wheel was, was made. We know when fire was made, and then we know agriculture mm -hmm. roughly within you know a thousand years or so. 
mm-hmm. in what part of the world. Every other invention we have, modern invention, you can trace back all the way back to some medieval monk or a Greek scientist or Egyptian person who, who did it. Yes. So in no place in there do you see alien intervention. Yeah. It's like the human brain just won't um, accept that a human could have been that brainy that many years ago. They just look at them as if they were just cavemen walking around when they don't even accept the possibility of maybe there was lots of people before that, the ancient cataclysms before then, for all we know. Well, I'll tell you, I say all that now when I first, I can't tell you on, online here, the words I used when I first walked up to the Great Pyramid, though. Yeah. <laughs> God, I mean, you you think about that and just you can't absorb it. Even as an engineer, I look at that. Oh my God! How in the hell? How in the world did they ever mm. conceive of this? Much less, I'm not interested in building so much as the design of it. Yeah. How do you conceive and coordinate and come up with that. Mm. Yeah, uh, it's wow! So it's easy to believe, make yourself believe that gods or aliens or somebody else did something fantastic to do this because it's it's hard to believe human beings could mm. but i i'm also i'm often <clears throat> i get these talks of people well we don't know how to do this we don't know how to do that i said you know average person that got any art, architects in the um, audience and typically not I said, okay mm. all you guys are interested in think aliens did all this ancient stuff overseas and around mm. how many here could build a um, 100 story skyscraper yeah do you know how it's built? No, you don't know. You wouldn't have a faintest idea how to get started. <laughs> Yet uh, you're going to sit here and pronounce about what the ancients did with what they did. So mm. don't get, don't give me that stuff, you know, right? Yeah, exactly. Good. That's a good way of putting it. And, and so, so many things are that way. That's a, but, you know, I wanted to mention about this novel, uh, yes. Silicon Blood, and other things I've written. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's so easy to write about nasty things and bad things because you know the bad guys are usually more interesting than the good guys. Yes. Unfortunately. Sometimes. I don't yes. know why. We we all love to watch uh, the Sopranos or the Godfather or something, you know. Yeah, we do. Because these these people get to exercise or dictators and warriors. They mm-hmm. they get to exercise power at least from the male side of the human race. Mm-hmm. Every male at some point or other would love to be able to settle the family business the way the Godfather did, you know. Yes. Just exactly. take care of all these irritating people that bother me and I don't like. Yeah. So that's one reason people write bad stuff. Mm. But I, I think the future, if we can avoid uh, a few crazies like the North Koreans there and some of the people in Iran, mm-hmm. perhaps in the future, it's going to get much better for everybody. I, I heard this report today, official government report. The guy was reading that in the last 20 years we brought – over 1 billion people out of extreme poverty, mm-hmm. mostly in India and China, mm-hmm. because they changed their way of doing business and education and yeah. economics and that sort of thing, you know. So they have a, <clears throat> a billion people been brought out of, they, they call it the, the paradox of progress. Paradox On the one hand, progress. the living standards, almost everybody in the world, except unfortunately places in Africa, mm. have, have improved. Yeah. Very poorest villages in China and India and South America live better now than they did 20 years ago. They're still not good, mm. but it's, it's, at least they're not starving to death on a daily basis. No. And that's that's progress. The paradox is that even though everybody's lifestyle is getting better everywhere, just about, mm. uh, weapons, yeah. and, uh, weapons of communication make it, <laughs> extremism make it uh, much more much more plausible. <clears throat> there will be a lot of disasters coming up in the future. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. With madmen with uh, red buttons, especially. <clears throat> or one kid in a uh, one kid dissatisfied kid in his mother's basement someplace working on a biolog- biological kit yeah. that comes up with a something bad. Yeah. Because in, in the few, it's, in the next ten years, you'll be able to do in a biology lab. Mm-hmm. that you can have in your basement, what only the best labs in the world can do right now. Mm-hmm. And so you start thinking about what happens when mm-hmm. you can invent not a, uh, a computer virus, but an actual, an actual virus, yeah. physical virus, or yeah. a, a new kind of animal. Yeah, exactly, especially with these 3D printing skin now. And yeah, I, I wrote the very first article, popular article, about 3D printing. Right. Uh, 
in uh, I think 1992. Oh no, crazy! That's awesome. It was called the Manufacturing Magic. It was in uh, uh, Analog Magazine, hmm. and um, in there I talked about the uses of 3D, what's now called 3D printing. We didn't have that cool term then, but uh, hmm. and uh, I talked about kids making guns. But I also talked about us having those in the home as an appliance, and we're still not there yet, okay. where you can look online and order whatever you want offline and online, and it Printed. you walk down to your Mr. Factory thing, and that you can watch it being made inside something the size of a washing machine or, oh, dryer, my goodness. <clears throat> or a microwave. Yeah. And in there, I said that someday in the future, we'll be able to not only get our books that way, but perhaps our clothing, our food, and maybe even our organs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, they're, actually, they're actually doing some of that stuff now. Yeah, I mean, you could be going out and getting really drunk, and then the next morning when you're hungover, you can buy a new liver. That would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, those <laughs> stranger things have happened. Stranger things will happen. <clears throat> Overall, I'm optimistic about the future. It's just like the old Chinese proverb was, uh, may you live at interesting times or curse. Mm. Uh, we have interesting times coming up. Uh, yeah. more people will be living better and longer and happier lives. Mm. But then you'll have a few people who have access to incredible amounts of information and technology that they'll be able to hurt people. Yes, yeah. that's the thing. So, Once we start creating these things, we need to create things that are going to shut them down as quickly as you create them as well. They, uh, <clears throat> they asked me when I was in Saudi Arabia what, uh, what I thought that, uh, the future held the Arab Spring was just about a year old at that time, and, and I gave them an example of what I had said in January 2009. I was at an undisclosed location doing some futurism for some people, and I held up a cell phone and I says, "This is the future of revolution right here." And they said, "What do you mean?" I said, "Well, for the first time in history, ordinary people will be able to communicate with each other without the government being able to stop them." Yeah. I said, "You're going to have revolutions at the speed of text." Yeah. Yeah. Well, two years later, when it happened at Tahrir Square in Cairo, uh, I was not surprised, and the people I talked to should not have been surprised. No, no. And then uh, the one fellow there in Saudi asked me, well, do you think that can happen here? Well, of course. I'm, I'm Saudi Arabia. I'm not about to get into political discussions. No way. Oh, no. <laughs> no, I, I, so we changed the subject quickly, but uh, mm. people were thinking about that even then. And who knows when people do get um, – Ability to have a 3D printer that's no larger than your uh, iPhone. Yeah, exactly. Or a shoebox, you put something in it and you can make anything you want, then uh, mm. Mm. the world can be interesting. Yes, exactly. And especially yeah. it's starting younger and younger. So these kids are getting this so brainy now, I think, with all these things like Raspberry Pi, uh, you know, the little mini computers that you can buy your kid. And they can yeah, create yeah. their, and then they're creating their own apps and stuff like that. So if it's starting that that young, you know, you don't just have to be a gifted individual to end up inventing something, do you anymore? My, yeah, yeah. My, I have a six-year-old grandson, my youngest of, of eleven, and he. Last summer, I paid tuition for him to attend a couple of small classes they were making, cool. using Legos to make robots. Oh wow. And they, and another class, they were actually programming robots. And here, they were, that was before he even started first grade. He was uh, wow. <laughs> designing and, and just like all the other kids, designing and programming robots. And, oh, that's so neat. They should do that anyway in, in schools, all and, schools. <laughs> yeah, I uh, and that was even a public school. Oh, wow. In, in North Carolina places. So uh, Cool. It's, it's a different world we're getting ready to. And the reason I always promote science fictional thinking mm. and reading is that uh, – like I said, if you think that way for very long, pretty soon you might be delighted or saddened by events, but you're probably you're probably never going to be surprised very much, and no. you'll never be shocked. You'll never be shocked by uh, stuff because you already thought about ten thousand different ways of yeah that tomorrow is going to bring. So my my daily routine is to wake up in the morning and after I get my eyes awake and i sip that coffee and get the caffeine flowing through my brain <laughs> and i look at my iphone and just see what the news is hold my breath and hope that the news is good you know we haven't lost a city or yeah lots of people or no asteroids are on the way and no new diseases and no. so after half an hour in the morning i'm usually 
pretty happy. Okay, the world. First off, I survived, and secondly, the world survived so far. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and look forward to the day. Yeah, you and I are very much alike that way. If I don't see it, I'll make sure I search for the page where I know I'd get that information before I finish my coffee. <laughs> well, my my uh, my home page is the Drudge Report, so I I can go from there to a hundred other things. And then there are a couple of sites I could actually uh, recommend. One is called The Anomalist. The Anomalist, okay. And the other one is out of Australia uh, called The Daily Grail. Daily Grail, okay. I think I've seen somebody posted about that, actually. Maybe it had been you. Anybody interested in all this weird stuff like we're talking about? Yeah. Uh, cool. Uh, both of those, those are, as soon after I read Drudge and the headlines, then I uh, flip to those two and read those. Cool. Oh, then, wow. actually, I my other uh, app I have on the iPhone is the BBC News. Oh, you do? Yeah. And then... Uh, there's one called Real Clear Science. That's good. And uh, hmm. well, there's an infinite number of apps, so I can't look at all of them. But those half a dozen I look at every morning, cool, and every evening. And uh, yes. I enjoy, especially in science and the science fiction areas, enjoy seeing things that I would have never thought about. Yeah. As an engineer, I I see a lot of inventions or progress. I say, oh, I would have thought about that eventually. Yeah. <laughs> Every once in a while, most of the time, I look at things that, wow, I would have never thought of that. Yeah, neat so ideas. I feel like even at it... advanced age, I'm still capable of learning. And uh, and this is why you've got all your notes everywhere that you're talking about. <laughs> oh, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, yeah. I've, I, in fact, I've I've got notes on – there's a notes app, you know, on uh, on the iPhone. And yeah. I've actually written, written stories on that. I've published two stories. Oh, cool. Are they the ones, um, the yeah, the digital stories that you've got uh, available for digital uh, viewing? Yeah, there are several. There's one, uh, you know, probably Google these, uh, yeah. I don't remember the exact site, but one called Foundation and Zombies. Oh, I didn't know that one. That's cool. Uh, it's a, uh, it's kind of a political satire, but yeah. you have to read it to understand. Yes, if, and that's available at I think stupefyingstories dot com. Stupefying stories, okay. I, I, I just write the stories. I don't make up the titles of the magazines. <laughs> cool. There's one called There's one called Anticlimatic. Right. It's available in the Australian uh, online uh, magazine called Sci Fi Journal. Right. S C I P H I Journal. Oh right. Com. Yeah. Anticlimatic is a tongue-in-cheek look at what would have happened if weather and climate science had advanced mm. instead of astrophysics. Yes, because that was my original one that I was saying that would make a good movie, but then you brought out uh, your recent one, which is the... Um, Silicon Blood. Silicon Blood, thank you. For goodness sake. Silicon, Silicon Blood is a novel. Uh, the other two are yeah. short stories. But, I have um, another one. I'll have another novel coming out sometime later this month called uh, Valley of the Shaman. All right. Okay. And it's it's uh, semi semi mystical, but actually it's, it's science fiction, but it's semi mystical. It takes place in a strange valley, a strange valley in uh, New Mexico, mm. a valley that I was actually in, but I just made up the events that go into the valley. But uh, that was, that was something I was going to ask you, actually. Do Does some of your um, things that you've done in the past or worked with in the past ever influence some of your um, work? Always. So, always, yeah. Uh, uh, many, many of uh, the early stories that I wrote are humorous stories mm. about, about technology, people, and computers. Because I worked at Bell Telephone Laboratories, and uh, I saw things all the time happen that people – put trust in computers that they shouldn't. Uh, they use computers the wrong way. Uh, yeah. And so I, in my lab notebooks and all my daily notebooks, I'm always making notes. Nowadays I make notes on the iPhone. But Fascinating. In later, but in the old days, I've still got hundreds of notes that I've never written any further because I just don't have time to go back and do everything. Well, at least you're keeping them. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, I go back. I just recently moved a lot of boxes of books from a home we had in New Mexico back to here in Kentucky. Right. About And some of the boxes have been closed for 20 years. Wow. 
in there I found loads and loads of pages. I said, boy, I should go back and write that story. That's still relevant. Interesting thing about writing science fiction, mm. if you write it properly, it doesn't age. No. No. Uh, if you make it too much about computers, you know, it will age. But mm. if you make it far enough in the future and don't put any too many present references, then yes. the story is still good 20 years later. I do hope you have time to, to carry on writing these books, and especially the ones that you've found recently. I mean, even if it's a short story, I, I, I probably would find that really entertaining and, and it's a great read. Well, thank you. I've got a – there's another ebook called uh, – a collection of science fiction stories called Other Heads and Other Tales. Oh, yes. That was online e- ebook. It will be reprinted in paperback form here sometime this year by my local publisher. Oh, cool. So that would be available. And that's a lot of the earlier things. And then the one I have, uh, one called F- F- Flash Fiction, which is short stories. Yes. Very sh- short stories called Future Flash. It's available now in paperback. and uh, Cool. It's on Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com both. Oh, neat. So it's interesting to do, and uh, I do it when I want to. I don't have to write for a living. No. Uh, I'd like to have done it sometimes, but I do have friends who write for a living, and they work hard. It's a job. Yeah. So uh, I've given up on jobs. I've had a lot of those. and <laughs> so I've been retired for three years now, and the, the only person I report to is my wife, and she's pretty nice. To me. <laughs> but I s- sleep in as long as I want, uh, at least until the dogs are up, yeah. and I go to bed when I want, which is usually about two in the morning. That's cool. That's uh, the life at Arlen, that is. Uh, well, it took a long time to get here, and uh, yeah. I des- recommend it. You deserve I recommend it. Retirement as soon as possible for everybody. Yes. Yeah. Unfortunately, over here, our retirement's gone up a few years, so everyone's got to work a few more years yet before they can well, retire. I- I worked until I was 73. Oh, wow. Excellent. Started at age 18. Oh, crikey. So you actually, actually before then, but the first professional job I had was as a missile tracker. Wow. What a job. White Sands Missile Range at age 18. It was fun using a telescope to track missiles. I, I bet I it saw was. It's never boring, <laughs> surely, any of your jobs, it seems. <laughs> no, no. Very seldom. Uh, I very seldom get bored. And, uh, mm. But anyhow, except for me, I had a lot of meetings that were boring that I had to go to. And so then I actually would write stories sometime during those meetings. <laughs> You're not writing a story now, are you? <laughs> I have to turn off these phones, I'll tell you. I know. Everyone's faces are either down and looking at the phones or they're ringing. <laughs> I thought I had everything turned off, but I didn't. It's okay. It's happened to me before. Right underneath my microphone nearly killed my, my uh, guest's ears. <laughs> <laughs> I watched... I watched an interview the other day they had on television. Uh, they were talking to some guy in Britain, I think it was, some famous consultant about some weighty topic. I think and I his little kid runs say. in, a little three-year-old kid runs in. <laughs> his nine-year-old kid runs in after that. And then the babysitter runs in after them. And Did you see? Time just talking about you know, the world and this, <laughs> the other and little kids are running around in the back. It's, it's quite I think, cute. <laughs> I think he handled that really well. And the fact that the uh, nanny was pulling the baby's uh, stroller, <laughs> what have you, over the child, the other child. <laughs> that was cute. That was cute. Everybody's, seems... everybody's human and everybody has to realize that they shouldn't be a pompous ass, you know. No, exactly. The desperateness of her trying to close the door was the most humorous. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I think he's, that film has actually been turned into a multi meme of all sorts of different people. Actually, a That's little great. bit of um, That's a great. yeah, it was. Well, thank you for coming on, Arlen, and I hope to have you back on soon sometime. Thank you, Lee. Thank you very much for having me on. It was my pleasure. Thank you. You're listening to the Hitchhiker's Guide to 42.